So today I'm going to be talking to you guys about read specific legislation. And my proposition is how BSLs are necessary to control pit bulls. Um, so first I'm going to be talking to you guys about how owners, um, how owners rather than the breed are the source of the problem. And then second I'm going to be talking to you about how pit bulls have traits that make them desirable companions. And third I'm going to be talking to you guys about how BSL will fail to solve the actual problem. So first I'm gonna go into like what BSL is and then a little bit of the history that the pit bulls have. So BSL stands for breed specific legislation. It's a law that bans or restricts certain types of dogs based on their appearance, usually because they are uh, perceived as dangerous breeds or types, oh wait, are perceived as dangerous breeds or types of dogs. So a little history about pit bulls according to pitbulls.org is um, pit bulls have been around since the 1500s. Um, They're basically bred to um, bite and hold bulls, bears, and other large animals around the face and the head. And um, in 1835, when um, in England, when um, baiting large animals was outlawed, um, people turned their attention to biting their dogs against each other instead. So um, that's what pretty much the polls after that. Um, in the 1800s though, despite the fierce prey drive um, hardwired into the original pit bull, they always made for excellent companions. Um, this came out of their fighting ancestry, which means that if, let's say, a fight broke out and their handlers, handler, like if, a, if they were fighting and, a, and they had a, and handlers had to go in and separate the dogs, the dogs had to be, I wanna say like, um, the fighters had to be able to go in, get their dog, take them out, um, be able to like clean their wounds, be able to control them in any aspect of that matter. And then if handlers weren't able to do any of that, these dogs, the pit bull, they were immediately killed or put down because they weren't able, because they didn't want any dog um, training against them, basically. So, um, yeah. Um, coming, um, when coming, to the Amer when coming to America in the 19th century, um, pit bulls were then um, put to work as fertile and, wait, hunters and herders, and herders for like, you know, herding other animals or hunting other animals. And over the 1900s, the pit bull gained its reputation as a courageous and loyal companion to both adults and children. Um, different people that had these type of dogs were Helen Keller, Laura Ingalls Wilder, and even President Theodore Roosevelt owned them. Um, pit bulls were also army dogs. The first dog de de decorated with medals in the armed forces was named a dog called um, Sergeant Stebby. After World War II, though, um, pit bulls were not cared really. After World War II broke out, pit bulls were, weren't really cared about anymore, and they were kind of thrown off the map, and they were actually considered as dangerous dogs after that. And then by the 1800s, the companion history of them um, was forgotten, and the myth of the dangerous dog began. And so going into like my first point, owners rather than the breed of the source of the problem, as I stated in the history with the pit bull, I explained that the handlers needed to actually handle their dog and be able to, you know, break the fight apart, be able to care for them in any of that matter. So, um, as you can see, the owners have a lot to do with how the dog is raised, whether um, they taught them how to fight, they taught them their way of how they want um, certain things done. The dog, the dog pretty much listened to the handler and did what the handler told them to do. And um, according to the seeds, well, People see the dog as vicious and aggressive towards people because of their breed, but according to CDC, additional strategies to encourage responsible pet ownership and reduce dog bites include regulatory measures and, reg and legislation programs to control unrestrained animals, um, such as licensing, neutering, and registration programs. Dangerous dog laws focus on dogs of any breed that have exhibited harmful behavior and place primary responsibility for a dog's behavior on the owner. Because a dog's tendency to fight depends on other factors such as medical and behavioral health, early experience, socialization, and training. 
So to get on my second point, pit bulls have traits that make them desirable companions. And just like any dog that has the ability to um, like have an emotional impact on a, on a person or help them medically or physically, so can a pit bull. Um, according to shelter to, shel shelter to a org, um, this organization pretty much um, has, it's an organization that people from like war veterans, they come and they seek out help from animals. And these are basically, um, there's two stories here that of, of a Ben and Tank and Rick and Kira. These dogs basically help these people to just recover from, you know, coming back to war and, you know, um, from post-traumatic stress disorder and other um, psychological injuries. And I also did research on, like, um, different stories of um, people, like, of children with autism. And there was this, actually, this there was a story of um, Joey Granados. He was, um, he was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, and it's a functioning end of autism spectrum. And he was always, um, he was really, like, autism, he was really hard of being able to stand still. Sometimes he had outbreaks or whatever. And his mom one day ended up getting him a dog. And this dog's name was Roxy. And it was a pit bull. And after that dog um, came into his life, his whole perspective just changed on life. And he was able to hug his mom and love his mom, things that he's never able to do. And um, to go to my last point, BSL will fail to solve the problem. Um, basically, banning breeds of finding a specific breed isn't the answer to it. Um, if, if pit bulls are banned for life, then people will just um, pick another dog and name it the dangerous dog. Um, according to the facts around BSL and why he is spelled by Bill Bruce, he states the, the reality is that the banned breeds are not overrepresented in terms of bites than other breeds, but the perception is that they are this is not a new phenomenon. In the early part of the 1900s, the bloodhound was considered the devil dog. In the 1960s, the German Shepherd got its place in the spotlight, followed by the Doberman Pinscher in the 1970s, and the Rottweiler in the 1980s, and then the Pitbull in the 1990s. So um, to conclude that, we focus mainly our attention on like what social media and what the television gives us of the aspects of these dogs. So we should be looking at more of the people behind the leash than the ones that are on it. The Zunite. What did you say? Zunite? Gesundheit. What does that mean? It's uh, like I wish you health. Okay. Auf Deutsch. All right, Melissa, the proposition is clear. The proposition's clearly identified, and you do have a preview of the contents. Uh, the phrasing that you have at the beginning, though, is one of the things that people often do in these kinds of presentations. It, they, they're used to not making an argument. Instead, they want to make it sound like it's an informative speech. So uh, most of your secondary points, for instance, are labeled with, I'm going to talk to you about how pit bulls are this way, or how it's the owners who are responsible for this, or how BSL is not required. And suddenly, it's an informative speech instead of declarative statement, which is, here's the line in the sand, and I'm taking this position on it. So you want to be careful about doing that. Uh, it's your, The language which hedges your argument a little more than you want to do. Um, there's a good preview of what the supporting structure is, that's fine. 
After you do the preview, though, you go into a very long narrative about the history of the pit bulls, and that takes up a big chunk of time. You don't actually get to the first supporting point in your speech until three minutes and 37 seconds into the speech. So that's when you get to that first supporting point. Everything else is just background, and that's a problem because you need to build your argument. You end up going overtime by almost two minutes also. The third point in your presentation was completely in overtime. It didn't really fit in to the time limits that you had. Part of that's because you do that long historical information there. That's either got to be eliminated or cut down substantially uh, when you're, when you're um, making an argument. A little bit of background sometimes is necessary, but I think that I got the impression that that's what you were most interested in talking about as opposed to the argument that you were making, and I think that that's a problem. Uh, the notion that the owners are the source of the problem is a good point, and I can see a little bit how you're trying to connect it to that historical information, but there wasn't really much citation of the historical information and so when we get to this point I don't think that you've got much proof on that in uh, on that idea that it is in fact the owners that are responsible for the way the pit bulls uh, behave and act and I I think that that should be something that's fairly easy to prove and you're just relying like I said on that context from the historical information which was vaguely uh, presented to begin with um, the uh, second point the, about the traits being uh, desirable, I did think that you did a little bit better job here providing evidence that's specific to those particular points. You do give us a source citation about the um, animals, you know, shelter to soldier uh, organization and how it uh, benefited uh, two particular examples. Then you have a third example that deals with a, a slightly different issue with the um, autistic uh, child. Uh, none of this, I think, is shown to be unique to pit bulls. I'm not sure that other dogs couldn't have provided the same kinds of benefits. So I think there needs to be a little bit more explanation about why it was pit bulls that made the difference in the lives of these people uh, that you're talking about. Um, the uh, There is a quote at the end on the last point where you're talking about how uh, you know, that breed specific legislation is not the answer. And you've got uh, a quote that talks about how, you know, in the past it was the bloodhounds and then it's the German shepherds and the Rottweilers and uh, the Dobermans and all that sort of thing. I thought that was, that was pretty good information that you had there on that point. But there's nothing really that tells me that breed specific legislation fails to work, you just make an assumption that says, well, they'll just go to another breed. Well, that's okay, if we get rid of all the bad breeds, why is that a bad thing? You know, what you want to be doing is making the argument that they aren't bad breeds, that the breed specific legislation doesn't work at all, and it's unnecessary. That's kind of the way that argument needs to develop a little bit more. All right, thank you.